Okay. We're going to split this agenda into sections. Sophie will take you through the first section, which is an introduction to the carbon neutral certification and tell you a bit more about the drivers and the relationship that they have with both with neighbours and with the Green Building Council of Australia. In section two, I will tell you a little bit about how to become accredited, which building types can be certified and the practicalities, what kind of other ratings you need to submit at the same time and how this relates to our other tools. My name is Sophie Gillies and I'm from the Department of the Environment and Energy in Canberra and have been working on the development of the standard and the implementation of this certification for over a year now. So I'll be delivering section one, the introduction to the carbon neutral certification. The learning outcomes for this section are that you will learn about the definitions of carbon neutral versus net zero energy and the role of offsets the context and governance structure behind the certification and the drivers for seeking certification, i.e. why will building owners be wanting this certification. So there are a number of different terms around that might seem at first glance to mean the same thing. You will have possibly heard the term net zero energy or a zero energy building. Now that is a building that generates the equivalent amount of renewable energy on site that it uses and that's measured on an annual basis. Now a carbon neutral building doesn't have to be a net zero energy building, although it might be. A carbon neutral building will have emissions and those emissions must be offset by purchasing carbon offsets that are eligible under the National Carbon Offset Standard. It also has a wider emissions boundary than a net zero energy building in that more emissions are included, uh, including those that are caused by the generation and disposal of waste in the building, water and wastewater. More on that from Dennis later. Those are called scope three emissions. So what is this offset term that we talk about? You would know in your role as assessors that even the most energy efficient building will almost never have zero emissions. Therefore, to reach zero emissions, it's possible to offset those emissions that cannot be reduced. What that means is financially supporting projects that either reduce the amount of carbon emissions going into the atmosphere or prevent carbon emissions from going into the atmosphere or remove carbon from the atmosphere. So the important thing about those offsets is that those emissions reductions would not happen without the financial support of the people purchasing and cancelling those offsets. So for example, uh, offset projects might be wind farms. Those are typically among the cheapest uh, type of offsets to purchase, depending on which country they originate in. Solar energy is another type, biomass, hydroelectric. You can see the types up there. One type that's not listed on the screen is uh, what we call savannah burning projects, which are indeed indigenous fire management projects typically in the north of Australia where traditional owners use traditional fire practices in the early dry season to prevent fires in the late dry season which reduces the amount of carbon going into the atmosphere. That last type that I've just mentioned is a very good example of an offset project that has what we call co-benefits. So co-benefits are where there are benefits created by the project that go beyond reducing carbon emissions. They might be better air or water quality or health or social outcomes for the population affected by the project. In the case of those savannah burning projects, those people that purchase the offsets are, are actually financing a project that not only reduces emissions, but allows the indigenous communities in those Northern Australian areas to visit areas of their country that would otherwise be inaccessible to them and pass on traditional knowledge in a way that they may not actually be able to do without the support to get out on country and do these practices. And for that reason, or partly for that reason, some offsets are more expensive than others. Those last ones that I talked about are among the most expensive to purchase, both because they're paying for a lot more than just the carbon emissions reduction, but also, uh, I guess, because those co-benefits are valued by the organisations that buy them. So in summary, to become carbon neutral, the people responsible for the building need to reduce the emissions for that building, which in the neighbour's pathway means achieving at least a four star energy rating. And then with the emissions that have not been reduced, offset those emissions, i.e. purchase enough offsets to bring emissions down to zero. So what's the context for this certification? Well, in October last year, the Department of the Environment and Energy published the National Carbon Offsets Standard for Buildings. As you can see, at the same time, we also published four other documents, which are the National Carbon Offset Standards for Organisations, Products and Services, Events and Precincts. The buildings um, certification is special because the certification is run by the Neighbours Administrator or the Green Building Council of Australia. So the importance of this document is that now for the very first time, a building that claims to be carbon neutral is bound by a consistent set of rules. When members of the public see that a building has been certified against the National Carbon Offset Standard for Buildings, they will know that those particular rules have been followed and that carbon neutral means what it means in the standard and that the definition is clear. 
The National Carbon Offset Standard is owned and maintained by the Australian Department of the Environment Energy. And we actually certify all those other four categories that you saw up there. But certification against the standard for buildings can be sought as an add-on to a neighbour's energy rating or a Green Star performance rating. So obviously the neighbour's administrator will administer the neighbour's pathway and the Green Building Council Australia, the Green Star pathway. Both of those organisations, including Neighbours, are sub-licensed to then issue the carbon neutral certification trademark to certified carbon neutral buildings. You can see a version of the trademark on the left-hand side of the slide there. What buildings will get, will use will look slightly different. It won't have the Australian Government crest or the words Australian Government initiative underneath, but it will say that that's for a whole building or a base building. So why will buildings be seeking this carbon neutral certification? So we've grouped the, the reasons that we're aware of from talking to our stakeholders into seven groups. And um, that first group there, value of proposition for buildings, what we mean by that is that buildings will be able to offer carbon neutral tenancies to clients if they are certified carbon neutral buildings. Now at the moment, demand for that is certainly going likely to come from existing carbon neutral certified organisations because if you're a carbon neutral organisation and your tenancy is in a carbon neutral building, that means that the emissions associated with the building that you're in can be counted as zero towards your carbon account. Or ultimately that's going to mean that you need to do less offsetting because the offsetting is already being done by the people responsible for the building certification. The certification can aid in staff retention if the staff of those tenants value working in a carbon neutral building. The certification is also a way to demonstrate leadership to your clients, to your customers, to your employees. A very simple way of doing that is that there is public reporting associated with the certification. So all of those stakeholders will be able to see at a glance that you have done what you need to do to get the certification. This may also differentiate the building from others and provide it with a competitive edge. Having the certification enables you to report against various global sustainability indices. These include the Global Reporting Initiative and the Dow Jones Sustainability Index. Six different Australian states have committed to achieving net zero emissions by 2050. I believe those are New South Wales, the ACT, Victoria, Queensland, South Australia and Tasmania. So what does that mean for buildings? Well, it enables them to contribute to those targets to prepare for states requiring them to do so. And those targets may well drive demand for carbon neutral tenancies from the various organisations that are required to make a contribution to those state targets. Similarly, the next uh, circle you see there, future proofing, simply means that if in the future, these kinds of certifications or elements of them or something similar become mandatory under legislation, then those organisations that have their buildings certified will be ahead of the game. By benefits from offsets, we're talking about the co-benefits that I mentioned earlier, that offsets can actually have major social benefits for the communities where the projects take place. Now, some organisations that have carbon neutral products or services and in the future buildings actually engage their staff in selecting the offsets that they will purchase. And they have said that this often gives their staff a sense of making a contribution to something really beneficial and meaningful. Finally, uh, the carbon neutral certification trademark is available to those buildings that go through the certification. So they will gain the right to use the trademark in accordance with the rules in the user guide that they will be given when they get certified. And what this means is that they'll have a, a visual and very instantaneous way of demonstrating to the public that they have done everything necessary to have a, a certified and verified carbon neutral claim. You'll see another version of that trademark on the next slide here. So what do all of these diverse organisations have in common? Well, I'm sure you've guessed that they either have a certification for a product or service that they sell or a carbon neutral certification for their business operations. And of course, we haven't yet seen Australia's first carbon neutral building, but the property sector and related sectors are already well represented among the leaders in this space. So you can see that we've got three property investment groups in Fraser's Property, GPT and Dexas, who have their business operations certified as carbon neutral. We have the real estate CBRE bit certified as carbon neutral. In the local government space, the City of Sydney was the very first local government to achieve certification, followed by the City of Melbourne. And most recently, we've certified the City of Brisbane, which is actually the biggest local government entity in Australia, and which serves over a million residents. So it's one of our biggest carbon neutral organisations today. There are also products available that can be purchased by the owners of carbon neutral buildings. Carbon neutral products here on this slide which will contribute as zero emissions towards their certification. So for example, uh, you can see down the bottom of the slide, this Real Utilities, which is an initiative of Fraser's Property Group, which they've developed to deliver energy to a number of their own developments. And all of the electricity delivered through Real Utilities will be carbon neutral. 
But outside of Fraser's Property Group world, it is possible also to purchase carbon neutral electricity through Energy Australia and PowerShop, both relevant to carbon neutral buildings. They can also purchase green power. The outcome in terms of carbon emissions is similar, but it's good to know that those choices are available. So this is not the complete set of carbon neutral organisations, products and services. You can see the web link there, which lists all of the currently certified entities and shortly we'll be adding carbon neutral buildings to that list. So in summary, you've just learned, I hope, that carbon neutrality means that emissions have been compensated for by investing in carbon offset projects. You've learned that neighbours will be certifying against the standard based on your assessments and some of the reasons why your clients will be increasingly asking for the certification pathway. In section two, I'll be telling you a little bit more about which assessors can submit an application, again, uh, which building types are eligible for this certification, the roles of the different people and the organisations involved, and finally, how this certification relates to other neighbours' tools while being quite different as well. So as you've heard a lot today, we're talking about a certification, not a rating. So I'll tell you a little bit more about the difference in a minute. So who can submit an application? In terms of assessors specifically, only assessors that are certified for Neighbours Energy and certified for carbon neutral certification can submit applications. And you'll hear a little bit more about why in a minute. So again, you do have to follow this webinar and submit an exam. And for your colleagues that have not been able to attend this webinar or want to certify in a month or six months, there will be an online course available as well. So in terms of the building types that can be uh, certified, it's only buildings with four neighbours energy stars or more that can be eligible for the certification pathway. And this is four stars without green power. There is a caveat, which is that buildings that are part of a portfolio, for example, if big portfolio wants to certify all of its buildings and one of the new buildings that they've acquired is not four stars, so long as they've made a formal commitment to achieving four stars within the next three years, then they can also get that building certified. That is pretty much the only exception. Otherwise, it, you have to have a four stars in order to be certified. As Sophie mentioned earlier, the standard also requires buildings to reduce their emissions before investing in offsets and seeking for this certification. And finally, we like to use the term building agnostic. The certification is building agnostic. What that means is that essentially any building type that neighbours certifies can receive this certification. So that means offices, in this case, only base building and whole building, um, shopping centres, hospitals, hotels and data centres. So that's only the infrastructure and the whole facility component of data centers. Any other building type should be uh, certified under the Green Star pathway. So you might want to get in touch with the GBCA if you have a different building type that you'd like to certify. So in terms of the roles and responsibilities of different parties, the building owner is usually a party that's requesting the certification. They'd also engage the assessor. They're responsible for providing access to documentation and also purchasing and retiring the offsets. The assessor their role is to collect the information according to both the standard and the rules that are being outlined today. They are also responsible for submitting the application. The Neighbours National Administrator, so that's myself, Dennis and the team here at Neighbours, we're responsible for auditing, so similar to any Neighbours energy rating, every submission is level one audited and 5% of them are level two audited. So level two audit is essentially recreating the whole submission from scratch, similar to a neighbor's energy rating. The national administrator is also responsible for answering technical queries and then of course certifying against the standard. The Department of the Environment and Energy represented here today by Sophie is responsible for the standard, updating it when needed. And they're also responsible for resolving unique situations uh, there are a lot of situations that we have to assess on a case-by-case -case basis. We'll always have discussions between neighbours and the Department of Environment and Energy, but ultimately they are the ones responsible for resolving them. However, they don't have any direct role in this specific certification process. And finally, we've heard a lot about the Green Building Council of Australia. They also certify against the standards, so the end result is the same. They might cover different building types, but they're not involved in the neighbours accreditation process. So in terms of other neighbours tools, every carbon neutral certification must contain a neighbours energy rating. So essentially, put in other words, the biggest component of the carbon neutral certification is a neighbours energy rating. That's because most of the emissions are already calculated there. So we don't want to double up in terms of workload. For neighbours water, you'll find out very soon, you also need water information for a carbon neutral 
certification and that information is exactly the same as for a neighbor's water rating. However, it is not mandatory to submit a neighbor's water rating at the same time as a carbon neutral certification. It's just going to make your life easier. It is exactly the same information, so you may as well. And similarly for neighbor's waste, it's exactly the same information you'll need for a neighbor's waste rating. And this is talking about the new waste rating that we're launching. As I mentioned earlier, what we're talking about today is a building certification. Essentially, what we're trying to say is that carbon neutrality by definition is zero carbon. So either you've reached that target or you haven't. So there's no middle ground. There's no, oh, I'm certified one star carbon neutral. Either the building has achieved it or it hasn't. So there's no rating of stars associated with the certification. And it is valid for one year. This validity period is aligned with the neighbor's energy rating with which it is submitted. As mentioned earlier, every application undergoes a level one audit. At least 5% of them undergo a level two audit and all the relevant documentation that you've used to prepare this application must be kept for seven years in case of a level two audit. But the important thing to remember also is that every first application has to be supervised. So you'll need to get in touch with us well in time when you do want to start an application because we'll need to assign a supervisor. Important to keep that in mind quick summary of what I just spoke about. In section two, we heard of that only assessors that went through this course and have submitted an exam can submit certification applications. Only buildings over four neighbors energy stars can be certified. Every application is quality controlled like an energy rating. Your first application will need to be supervised.